But regardless of the model, we know that there are several documented benefits to dual enrollment for all students. So dual enrollment is often associated with uh, decreasing high school dropout rates, increasing college going rates, uh, facilitating more seamless transitions to college and exposing students to academically rigorous curriculum. And so given these benefits, we think it's very important for state policymakers to consider better investing and heavily invested in these programs and making sure that boys of color are equitably represented within them. Um, and then some states may also find it worthwhile to establish dual enrollment programs and career and technical education programs, particularly those that lead to employment that pays a livable wage. Now in doing so, and this is very, very important, we think it's very important to not track boys of color only to career and technical education programs, right? We think it's important for students to have a range of options, a range of viable options that get them in a good place uh, in preparing them for life after high school and into college. But it's very important that it doesn't become um, a way to sort of track, again, to do what has been traditionally done, which is to track students who are perceived to be high achieving into uh, you know, more academic programs that lead to college and to track uh, you know, students of color, particularly men of color, into career and technical education programs. Uh, next slide. We are also recommending that uh, states establish a statewide initiative with measurable goals and outcomes for high school completion, matriculation to post-secondary education, and completion of college degrees and certificates for men of color, boys and men of color. So a policy that requires graduation rates for disproportionately impacted subgroups to be within a certain percentage points of the overall graduation rate could garner the urgency that is necessary for districts to improve them. A similar approach should be considered for college preparation and matriculation. And while increasing the number of men of color enrolling in post-secondary post education will help to improve the status of men of color, making sure that they actually earn degrees and certificate is also necessary and important to do. Uh, next slide. Uh, our next policy recommendation is to hold institutional leaders accountable for increasing enrollment retention and success of men of color. And so what we know from um, the work that we've done, you know, from both our work and experience in working uh, in post-secondary edu education for as long as the three of us have been, institutional leaders will prioritize goals for which they're evaluated and held accountable. And so far too often, the success of boys and men of color is treated as negotiable and not given the attention and the resources that other institutional goals are afforded. And so therefore, we say that if increasing post-secondary post -secondary enrollment retention and success of men of color is indeed a state priority, then college, university, and system leaders must be evaluated based on how their institutions meet this goal. So every post-secondary education leader in the state should have clearly articulated goals and metrics for improving outcomes for men of color uh, upon which their performance is evaluated each year in a manner that is similar for how they're evaluated for meeting fundraising goals, as an example. So in addition, candidates who are interviewing for leadership positions in public post-secondary institutions should be expected to present a plan for how they will close equity gaps for men of color if they are indeed selected uh, to serve in these roles. Next slide. I think we all know that um, having easily available access to real-time post-secondary education student data are, that are disaggregated by subgroups is essential for educators to target resources and support to students who are impacted by equity gaps and outcome disparities. And we also know that these data are often unavailable, and if they are available, they're very difficult to access uh, or they're not updated in a timely manner in most states. And so efforts to improve post-secondary education access and success for men of color cannot be as timely and targeted as they need to be in the absence of data like this. And so statewide investments in robust data systems that track students from their enrollment in kindergarten through post-secondary education are essential to measure the extent to which men of color are being served equitably in the state and to improve accountability for their success. And uh, our last policy recommendation before we talk about what institutional leaders should do is to support statewide efforts 
that reduce or eliminate costs as a barrier to access to post-secondary education. Um, you know, both the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the rapidly increasing cost of living in the United States have had a huge negative impact on enrollment and post-secondary education for all students, not just men of color, but for all students. And so men of color, particularly Black, Latino, and Native American men have experienced the most significant enrollment decreases when compared to enrollments in uh, before spring of 20. And so in addition, socially constructed messages about masculinity that suggest that men, that suggest to men that the only value they bring to a household is that which fulfills breadwinner expectations have always created anxiety and gender role conflict for men who are expected to take care of their families. And so given these trends and challenges, it is very important to keep the cost of attending community college as low as possible. And it's important that state leaders do everything they can to preserve this um, as a resource and as an opportunity for men of color. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Wood, who's going to share recommendations for institutional leaders, and that'll take us uh, right up to the end of the webinar. Thank you, Luke. That sounds good. Thank you so much, uh, Frank and Marissa, for the context that was provided. And um, just as a, a note to folks, I know that people have already started putting questions for us in the chat window. And in the Q&A function, please use Q&A for the questions and then comments you might have for one another for the chat. Uh, but we're very glad to um, be able to uh, have you here for this conversation. So I'm going to talk about recommendations for institutional leaders. What should folks who are working at the institution be focused on? And I should begin by saying that when we think about institutional leaders, that's a term that we use broadly defined. There's lots of ways in which people can show up as either formal or informal leaders on a campus. And so these are the things that if you consider yourself a leader as a faculty member, as a staff member, as an administrator, that um, all, all of the folks can work together collectively on to address and improve outcomes and enrollment for our men of color. So the first thing that we think is that we have to adopt early alert systems and intrusive approaches uh, to support men of color. So uh, many of you um, have seen prior uh, work that we've done on early alert systems versus early warning systems. Usually the delineation is an early warning system is when a student is transitioning into the college, uh, you're doing an assessment that's triaging them into different levels of service based upon need. Whereas early alert is when they're already within the institution and we're using indicators of course progress to determine whether or not um, there's a need for intervention with that student. And we've said in our prior work on this that an early alert is not early if it happens halfway through the semester. It's one that has to happen earlier on. We've always recommended 18% of course progress. So whether it's a six-week course or a 16-week course, think about what is 18% uh, of progression through that course. And that's when the alerts should be able to begin so that students have enough time to be able to adjust and respond to those uh, to concerns as they might um, arise. The other part of this is intrusive approaches. And intrusive means that uh, we're using high touch support for students and we are providing them with interventions and support before they even uh, come to us and convey that it's necessary to do so. So an early alert system can certainly be that, you know, you can identify students based upon whether they're showing up to class um, a little bit late, they're leaving early, incomplete assignments, uh, not scoring well on certain exams and assignments, and then, hey, there's an opportunity and need for us to intercede and, and basically move forward with that student. In addition to that, uh, it can also just be ongoing um, organizational level efforts. So one effort that, that, that we have personally um, been involved with, as well as uh, here at both at our own institution and as well as other institutions as well, is having a connects team. And what that means is that uh, and, and how this uh, process and strategy started for us was after the murder of George Floyd, we recognized that there was the need to make sure that we were having better connections with our students to understand what they were going through. And so we called all of our Black and African American students to ask them, how are you doing? Are you okay? Do you need anything? And we heard stories of pain. We heard stories of challenge. Remember, this is the height of the pandemic, uh, the racial tensions within the country were also at an all-time high. And we heard challenges that students were experiencing, but we also recognized that we had incredible resources and systems of support that were in place that if we connected those students 
total its resources and services that we could better address those issues. Counseling and psychological services, academic advising, tutoring, career services and employment, financial aid. And so uh, what we did was this, is that we called all them, we got this feedback, we heard these challenges, and then we triaged them into different services. And now as a practice, as a regular practice that we espouse, we believe that most institutions should be calling all of their, uh, their students of color, particularly those who experience disproportionate impact on a weekly basis. You can rotate one week phone calls, one week text messages to find out how are they doing and then to um, intercede, use a case management approach to triage them into different levels of service based upon the issues that are identified, but then also have all the information amalgamated together so that the larger patterns for that week can be reported to those in leadership across campus to be responsive to issues that are being raised by students. And that's uh, a process that if folks have specific questions on, we can certainly walk you through uh, what that looks like. We know that that has a benefit in terms of intensified benefit for success for all students, but we know that for our, our minoritized students, particularly our men of color, that it can have an even more intensified benefit. And one of the reasons for that is that we know, um, as was talked about in our sociological outcomes model, that for some men and for some men of color, that help seeking um, can be um, viewed as a sign of weakness. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing systems of support and resources that meet students and create, um, create an environment where they feel that they can engage and rely upon campus services. The next one is to establish a campus environment that ensures that students feel at home. Now, um, this is less on the, hey, how do we get more students enrolled side? And more so on the, how do we retain the students that we have already? And a lot of it comes down to creating an environment where students feel that they're not a guest in someone else's house. And many of you heard me talk about this concept before, and it comes from the work of Dr. Caroline Turner, uh, who talked about that when our students of color come onto college and university campuses, that the sites that they see, that the smells, that the images on the wall, that the building names are going to be representative of communities that are not their own. And so oftentimes for many of our students of color, they can feel like they're a guest in someone else's house. So what are things that we can do that can help make students feel at their, like they're at home? You know, for many institutions is establishing cultural resource centers or even specific identity centers for particular student populations where they can go and be in a shared space and shared sense of community with others. It can be looking at the names of the buildings and having uh, processes to either cultivate donors or do honorary namings of buildings so that the, the images that the students see of, of building names on campus is reflective of the diversity that they're bringing uh, to that in campus environment. Uh, you can also think about it in terms of the art um, and presentation, paintings, murals, et cetera, that are on campus. Are they reflective of diverse students? Um, and like for our own institution, we have a mural uh, what's called the Black and the Crimson and Black, and it and it portrays the Black first um, at our institution, the first Black student, the first Black graduate, first Black male student, first Black administrator. And so the whole point is to demonstrate that uh, your community has a long history, our community has a long history here at this institution. And so there's different ways that we can talk about making it so that students can feel at home. But one of the most important strategies for doing that is to simply ask students what it is that they would like to see and then to be responsive to that. And we'll come back to that point in a later moment. The next thing to do is have is to incorporate enrollment goals, retention, and completion. So all three sides of this into the institution's strategic plan. Oftentimes what we see is that a institution will create a plan for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Or, or a DEI plan all, all wrapped into one, and then they'll have a strategic plan, but those two plans will not speak to one another. And often what we find is that a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan is funded on one-time funds, temporary funds, uh, may have some people who are appointed to make sure that it's happening and moving forward, but it usually does not have the same level of institutional buy-in resources permanent and base do dollars that come with a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. And so our recommendation is that those plans should be integrated either into one process or that the DEI goals for enrollment and retention and completion 
should be so tightly woven into the strategic plan that it's hard to, uh, to tell the two from one another. We believe that this is important because if you do not have stated goals, it is highly unlikely that there will be the efforts needed to try to move the institution towards better serving our men of color. And so that should be goals around how are we going to do enrollment? How are we going to recruit from high schools, from the local community? How are we going to market our programs? How are we going to reclaim students who've moved on to um, and have not returned? Uh, it's the retention side in terms of are we creating uh, uh, programs that provide wraparound services, first year experience programs, mentoring programs, and then completion goals. Are we preparing students for both completion and post uh, and their life after um, completing their associate's degree, or if you're at a four-year university, a bachelor's degree. Um, but what are we thinking about in terms of that? The next thing that we believe is that we have to build a capacity of all educators to serve our men of color equitably and responsibly. And I would also add professionally. Um, we know that from the work that we've done on men of color that they uh, oftentimes experience academic environments through a lens of distrust, disdain, and disregard. Distrust, where they are assumed to be criminals, dangerous, deviant, up to no good, to have some sort of malintent to cut corners. And so we see them oftentimes more representative in university judicial processes, college judicial processes, uh, visiting ombuds offices. And so we want to make sure that we're not criminalizing the same population that we know is oftentimes overexposed to exclusionary discipline in earlier levels of education, particularly for Native American men and Black men, or Native American boys and Black boys when we're thinking about the earlier levels of education. The second is they are oftentimes viewed through an ascription of intelligence, so they're assumed to be academically inferior in comparison to their peers. And the third is that they're viewed through a pathologized lens where we blame students, we blame their families, we blame their communities. And the examples that you gave earlier of those deficit perspectives perfectly portray the same things that we hear when it comes to serving our men of color. So how do we build capacity? All educators have to have routine, ongoing professional learning and then not a one-shot deal. If you do a one-time training on microaggressions, it's usually a waste of everyone's time. It has to be an ongoing conversation about topics such as inclusive teaching, culturally relevant support, multicultural counseling, implicit bias, racial microaggressions, race lighting, racial battle fatigue. It has to be ongoing conversations around these topics so that we can better prepare educators to go and to teach students and to engage students that many of them never thought that they would do. And in fact, one of the things that we talk about in our work is that it is not uncommon for our educators to be subject matter experts, to be really good in biology or cultural anthropology or some area, but then to not necessarily have the prerequisite training and development that's necessary to be effective classroom instructors. And so we know that many educators were not trained how to teach. And so what they do is that they teach how they were taught. And usually how they were taught is not how our students of color learn, and even more specifically, how our men of color learn. We think that we have to do a better job in coordinating efforts around basic needs. Many of our men of color experience issues such as food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation concerns, employment barriers, and other challenges. And what we know about insecurity from the work that we've done is a one insecurity in and of itself actually does not have an impact on success. So if you were to experience, for example, housing insecurity in isolation, no other challenges, or food insecurity in isolation, no other challenges, it usually does not have an impact on your success. It's actually the combination of food and housing and transportation on those multiple factors that creates the outcome disparities that we see. And in fact, the vast majority of students who experience these challenges don't experience them in isolation, but they experience them in, talent, in tandem. And so we have to be coordinating efforts around basic needs that make sure that they're being intrusive and providing students with the support that they need. But in the context of men of color, going back to some of the challenges that we mentioned earlier around help seeking, you may find that they're less likely to use the resources that are available. So you have to be much more strategic as we've talked about in previous webinars in reaching out and engaging men of color. The images that they see in terms of the advertisement, uh, demystifying uh, the need to ask for help, or even having a policy where, hey, if you need resources, you can get it for yourself or for someone else who needs it, recognizing that the student may not want to disclose. I also know that for many of us who do this work on basic needs, we know that there is a need to know who is receiving resources, what is going on so we can better support them. 
But we also want to recognize and balance that with some challenges that we may see around apprehensive to seek out, apprehension to seek out help. We also want to be engaged with industry partners around career and technical education programs. Uh, of course, we want to do this around all of our programs, but particularly around these programs, which might provide quick opportunities or quicker, more efficient opportunities to gainful employment so that students can have those opportunities to move forward and be, and be financially stable while then continuing on their pursuits and their degrees, which is why we have always advocated for stackable credentials and other types of certifications that allow students to, uh, to continue to improve and continue to grow and build upon the earlier work over time. We firmly believe that every single college and university in the country should establish a presidential task force focused on men of color. The data that, that Frank presented earlier and, that, uh, and the challenges that Marissa enumerated in terms of deficit perspectives demonstrates that we have to be more focused on providing support for our men of color. And so a presidential task force has the, the, the power of indicating that the, the primary person responsible for stewarding and leading the campus has, has said that this is important, that this is timely, that this is urgent. And I will say this, in our work and working with campuses, we rarely find a campus that is successful overall in addressing these issues unless the president and other key leaders, such as the vice president for instruction, vice president for student affairs, board members, uh, faculty, senate, are all on the same page saying that this is, again, important, timely, and urgent. So one of the biggest platforms to be able to elevate this conversation focus is at that presidential level. They have a task force that looks at the experiences of men of color across these areas, does interviews, focus groups, collects data, and then uses that to make recommendations that can then be fed through the shared governance process at the institution to create the kind of changes that are necessary for men of color. And as I've said throughout all of these recommendations, we have to lift up the voices of men of color. So they have to be part of the conversation. Um, they have to be uh, eliciting that, that feedback and perspective from them so that when we're designing resources and interventions that serve them, or that better prepare educators to serve them, that we're being attentive to the actual needs. Most of our institutions don't have unlimited resources, so it's absolutely incumbent upon us that we're gaining the best information and insight possible to be responsive to the challenges that we're seeing. And lastly, we believe that we have to align faculty hiring, tenure, and promotion processes to close equity gaps. One of the things that we've worked on at our institution, as well as many of our community college partners, are establishing new hiring criteria. Hiring criteria that's based upon the students that experience disproportionate impact. And this is what we mean by that. If you look at your data and you identify that, let's say you're, you're Black, you're Native American, and Southeast Asian and Latinx students have outcomes that are lower than that of their peers, particularly for men, right? Then we should be, if our goal is to, is to close those gaps, we should then be intentional about hiring individuals who have demonstrated knowledge, demonstrated commitment, and demonstrated success in working with those populations that they either have teaching and or service that's focused on these populations. So that we're hiring individuals as we would with any criteria within our institution that help us to address the strategic priorities of the organization. And so what we have at our own institution is criteria called BIE, where faculty members in order to be hired, they have to show that they have a demonstrated record of success in either doing teaching and service focused on minoritized populations, many of the same populations that we're talking about today. And there's other community colleges that have done this and used this criteria to do cluster hires focused on this population as well. But it's not just enough to hire people who have this experience and this background. We also have to recognize that we have to embed it into the evaluation of teaching and the evaluation of service for both the tenure process and the promotion process so that we are honoring the fact that the people who should be elevated within our organization are those that can help our organization close the equity gaps that we say are important to us. And with that, um, we will go ahead and transition to uh, q and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing uh, screen here. And I think we have a, a few questions that were already uh, put up in there for us to be able to respond to. 
Yeah, so we started to try to respond to them in writing. There were so many good questions. So we apologize that we're not able to get to every question, um, but we are do we will do our best. Uh, Doctor, what I do have one I want to um, ask you. So you talked about several online training topics that will be good for uh, institutions to offer. Could you maybe uh, briefly recap what some of those were? Um, yes. So those training topics include uh, in, uh, inclusive teaching and learning, um, course redesign for racial equity. I didn't say that, but that would be one I'd like, like to add in there. Implicit bias, racial microaggressions, racial battle fatigue, race lighting. And these are things that you can readily find information available on. Um, we have, um, with our own work, we've done lots of different webinars and presentations that are publicly available that folks can uh, take a look at. I would encourage people to look at scholars in terms of uh, who have background in this work, like Ebony Zamani Gallagher, uh, William Smith, in terms of racial battle fatigue. Um, and I would also leave it to, to you all to, to mention some other names that we think that folks should be looking at as well. Yeah. Um... You know, anything on racial microaggressions, I think the work that, that Dr. Vasquez has led on uh, basic needs and securities. Um, we also need to look at, you know, I think some of the, the communities that are um, that men of color tend to be a part of within community colleges. So your athletic programs, there should be, you know, a lot of work um, and support with, with coaches and faculty or teaching uh, in athletic programs. Uh, I'm probably missing some off the top of my head, but yeah, those are those are something that I would suggest. And then Marissa, I wanna hear from you as well on that, but I would also add in uh, anything that's done by uh, Victor Sines and Luis Ponwan. Of course. Oh, and Emmett Compost, speaking of that, is, um, is, in, is in here. He was here earlier, so thank you for attending. Dr. V, anything else you wanna to add to this? Um, no, I think you've already you know mentioned some of our other colleagues. Uh, Sua Zhang, I would also add for right. research on Southeast Asian um, men in particular. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's still a growing number of research on um, queer men of color yeah. in particular, um, and specifically in the community colleges. But I'll, I will say um, Dr. Angel Gonzalez um, is definitely someone that's leading um, a lot of that work. Um, yes, uh, Adrian Huerta also. I could see oh, yeah. That. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, and I mean, a lot of these folks you can find also with our pro within our project mails, um, faculty and research affiliates. Um, you know, uh, you can look, see a lot of the work um, there. And speaking of project mails, and yes, this is this is another uh, shameless plug for the report. We're hoping everybody will read it. But in the report, we um, we do some spotlights on five. Uh, model men of color programs. So Bunker Hill College has a program. Miami Dade College has a program. The Community College of Baltimore County, uh, the City University of New York uh, Black Male Initiative Program, and the Community College of Philadelphia Center for Male Engagement. Now, this is not to say that those are the only promising programs that are working well. There's only so many you can highlight in a report like this. But um, those are five. If, if folks are looking to get started and wondering, okay, where you know where should I be looking? Where should I be designing and thinking about in terms of program components? If a program is the approach you're going to take, which we're not suggesting that that's the only thing you should do, but those are some programs that we would uh, we would point to as examples. Um, the, the there were other, there were some other a few comments and questions about hey. This is all fine and good in California, but how do we, I, I work in Texas or I work in Florida, you know, how are we going to, or, you know, some of these other anti-DEI states, you know, our response there is that we know that we have a lot of work to do to, to support this work and to support colleagues who are doing this work in states like that. We don't have like immediate strategies to offer off the top of our head, but just know that it is indeed a priority for us. And uh, we're certainly going to be, be working in this. Um, doing the work that we think is going to help us address the needs of both our colleagues and men of color in those states as well. So um, thank you for that. Uh, yes, the recording will be made available to all registered attendees. 
And so we'll make sure that we, um, you know, provide that for, for those who either uh, had to join late or, you know, maybe couldn't make it. Um, we're going to put the report in the chat again one more time because we know that, um, you know, we pasted it a few times and it might be hard to get to. Um, anything else that y'all are seeing that we should respond to? Marissa? Um, nothing. Not, I mean, there's a lot of really great questions, I think, and I'm hoping that some of those were answered already. But I do want to give also a, a shameless plug for one of our um, more recently, like, um, newly minted doctoral students from our, our program, Dr. Helen Young. Um, who did an incredible study on the impact of um, culturally relevant uh, cohort-based programs, um, specifically like Emoja and A2 Mend, and how that affect or well, influence students' transfer specifically to HBCUs, and then also looking at the relationship between the environmental and um, you know uh, kind of like campus climate at HBCUs that um, echoed and you know were, were similar to the, the work that um, our colleagues within the California's community college systems um, working work with black men in particular. Um, so I, I you know I'm encouraging her to publish that work, but I think that's also something to keep in mind is just the the impact of um, you know exposing students to um, you know to HBCU like transfer fairs or um, uh, just a lot of the other work that we've we've already seen. So shameless, yeah. that was it. Yep. And then also um, Dr. Ray Ramirez, who's a colleague at Fresno City College, who does a lot of great work that's focused on uh, equity planning. And so, um, you know, strategic planning and equity planning. So those are, those are important processes to align your men of color work with. And so take a look at Ray, reach out to Ray as well for those who are looking for some some uh, expertise around planning in that regard. Uh, anything else that y'all are seeing? No, I, I just, um, one thing that has been coming up in the chat, just want to acknowledge that um, moving forward, some of these efforts in the ways that we've discussed can be difficult in some different state contexts. Obviously yes. we're very aware of what's going on nationally with the pushback against uh, DEI initiatives, um, ethnic studies, critical race theory, and the impending uh, end of affirmative action. And so we know that there is a, a climate that is a national climate that's being felt at, at the local level for many people that is emblematic of that kind of pushback and, and backlash uh, to progress that's been made. And so one is just want to acknowledge that, that some of these recommendations are harder to do so. Um, one strategy to consider is that in most areas, you can still do equity work because that's more of a federal designation. And so sometimes you may need to frame the efforts in that way. Um, there are other strategies and practices that we could certainly offer as a, as a separate conversation um, uh, to, to this, but certainly want folks to feel that you have the support of others who care about the work that you're doing and realize that you may be doing so in a context that is hostile. All right, everyone. Well, we just want to thank you so much for being supportive of the work and being here. Please follow up with us if you have questions, comments, fears, or trepidations. Uh, as always, we uh, appreciate uh, the support you have given us in terms of uh, you know, attending these webinars throughout the years. And again, we want to close by thanking um, our co-sponsor, the Association of Community College Trustees, uh, for supporting today's conversation. And read the report. Read and share. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.